We are in day one of 21 days of prayer and fasting. It is day one. And um, I pray that you have contemplated, deliberated, that you have contested for the next 21 days in the spirit. And I pray that God will meet you at every corner. I pray that as you put some things aside and as you starve the flesh and as you reinvigorate the spirit, I pray that God, he's going to meet you there. I think where there is faith and where there is a stirring of faith, and it's not about the size of faith, but it is about the quality of faith. The Bible talks about having faith the size of a mustard seed. It's, it's not necessarily big faith, little faith, but it's about the quality of your faith. Does your faith have your strong yes? Because if your faith has your strong yes, then absolutely God will meet you with every step, with every action step taken in faith. God will meet you there. It is a promise. It is signed, sealed, delivered. So I want to question your quality of faith today. Don't go half measure. Don't hold back. Don't squander or don't be stingy with your faith. Put all the chips in. It is time to bet on God. Yes. Bet on God. The next 21 days, I promise you, if you set aside the things of your life that you are so consumed with and you let the all-consuming nature of God come in and consume you, wow. But you have to be consumable. You have to be consumable. We cannot expect to be consumable and be consuming everything at our fingertips. We must set ourselves apart and we must be a company of people that are consumable by his fire, by his presence. We are desperate for his presence. And before you go and search for his hand, I want to encourage you, search for his face first. We often look for his hand to provide. We often look for his hand to come and rescue us. We often look for his hand to guide us. But God is saying, seek my face. Fall in love with me. Seek my presence. And where my presence is, there will be provision that will follow. But follow me first. Don't go straight for the hands. Go straight for the face in Jesus' name. It's hunger that drives you and compels you, but it's what you feed on that will lead you to the things that God has for you. That is not my quote. That is Pastor Jensen Franklin. He's an incredible general in the faith, and he said that, and I think there is nothing more true than that. We are definitely compelled by something, but it's what you feed, that thing that will take you in the right direction so the title of this message is called Battle Plans. So we are about to step into the battlefield for the next 21 days. And I pray that the battlefield will extend beyond the 21 days. I pray that we live our lives on this proverbial battlefield. And I don't say that to scare anyone. I say it to say that the battlefield doesn't mean defeat. We need to change our perspective on the way we see the battlefield. When you are in line and in step with the Holy Spirit and there is communion and there is relationship, the battlefield should not have a negative connotation. It is, it should scream, I am more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. So come on, let's go. Let's get into the battlefield. So we're about to get battle ready and I'm going to give you the battle plans for what's ahead. You know, we're going to sit behind enemy lines for a little bit and we're going to observe some tactics that the enemy uses against us. So if we are going to be victorious, we need to have our eyes set on the right things, but we must be aware that there is a snake among us. There is a, an enemy that prowls like a lion ready. I don't know that the, the, the posture of something that is ready to prowl would mean that they are ready in position, waiting for an opportune time to come and consume come and destroy. And so we need to be super vigilant of the tactics and the schemes and the posture of the enemy. And I don't say that to scare you, a posture, an enemy that's postured and ready to, to prance or to, ready to attack, that should not scare us. It should not scare us. There's no fear in what the enemy has. We have ultimate authority over the schemes and the games and the things he throws our way. And my heart and desire is to expose his tactics 
because it's like a shadow that's being projected and it's bigger than what it is. But if you look at what's behind it, it's this little thing that is powerless and his, na- his days are being numbered down. And I, we know the end of the story. Just read Revelations. We know that he will be defeated. He was defeated when Christ snatched the keys from him and, and gave him his death sentence. We're just on borrowed time. So we're going to get there. We're going to learn about what he does. But there's this hormone called ghrelin. And I think I'm saying that right. But anyway, it's the hunger hormone. And basically, it is the the hormone that, that alarms our stomach and our brain that we are hungry and that we need to eat. And I am praying and believing that we will have spiritual ghrelin in the next 21 days as we set aside, you know, Things that, like I said before, would consume us. I pray that there would be a spiritual hunger that would rise and that we would find ourselves in the presence of God and that we would be partaking um, and having communion with God, with community, before our word, in a worship posture, in a posture that is thankful and grateful. These are great spiritual practices. Okay, we're going to get straight into it. We're going to read from Matthew 4. And we're going to pick it up from verse 4 to 11. And I'm going to break it down. We're going to get some, the, some of the enemy's intel from Jesus being led into the wilderness. And we're going to profile the devil. And we're going to profile his tactics. And you're going to take these ta- tactics and you're going to be able to implement. And you'll be able to be vigilant. And you're going to be able to, to be aware of how he tries to come in and create confusion, and havoc in our lives. And I believe there are people in this place, and the Lord put this on my heart, that there's some of you that you are living in a state of confusion. And that is not from God. That is from a spirit. It's a Leviathan spirit that brings chaos and confusion. And what it does is it twists words around, and you start to begin to listen to lies, and then you're deceived, and then before you know it, you've been trapped. And I'm here to say that that is not your portion, and God wants to take what is crooked in your life, and he wants to make it straight. He's taking the things of your life that are lies, and he is bringing clarity and truth to them. There are people in your lives that are filled filling your minds and your heads with lies. And God is saying, I am going to clear the account and I am going to step in and I am going to bring truth, okay? We just need to be aware that the devil is so active and ready to just kill, steal, and destroy. More of that later, but let's, let's pick it up from verse four. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Point number one, we're gonna draw a tactic here from the devil. So one thing we need to know is that it was the spirit of God that led Jesus out into the wilderness. It wasn't the devil that took him out. And I think some of you think that the devil is leading you into some wilderness places, that he's leading you into some deserts, but I believe God is leading you somewhere because he is trying to get you to be co-dependent full dependency on him. So don't mistake in the hand of God in a season for the devil. The devil is trying to do his thing, but God is pulling us away from the distractions. He's pulling us away from the confusion. He's pulling us away from the noise and he wants time with you. So the spirit is going to lead us into dry, quiet places that feel obscure and they feel like, where are you and what is this? But no, those are the places that he will speak. Those are the places that he will come close. Those are the places where you will feel and sense his presence. Okay. So number one, if we are going to be aware of these tactics, we need to understand that God is in control. Everyone say it, God is in control. The spirit took Jesus into the wilderness. You know, Jesus is called the second Adam. The first Adam walked through the garden and was, and was tempted and gave into Satan and got us all kicked out into the wilderness. The second Adam, Jesus, walked the wilderness and put us all back into the garden. He put us all back in relationship with God. But we need to be aware that God is sovereign. We need to be aware that he is powerful, that he has comprehensive rulership, and he is good. 
Isaiah 46, 9 says, remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there was no one like me. I make known the end from the beginning and from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. We are not being led by some cosmic killjoy. He is very intentional about where he is leading us. And first and foremost, before fat bank accounts and influence and relationships. He is leading us into relationship with him. And out of that relationship will spring health and spring all the desires that align with his will for our lives, okay? So we need to know, okay, rule number one, in this whole situation, God is in control. You have to believe that. If there is doubt that God is bigger than your circumstance, you're going to fret and you're going to be afraid in this journey. But if I tell you, if you can direct your faith to the fact that God is in control, you're, you've already won half the battle. You've already won half the battle. Okay, number two, verse two, sorry. After, the fa after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Jesus was hungry. Some translations say that he was ready for the battle. I was under the understanding that he was fasting during this kind of altercation with the devil, but he had already done the 40 days. So physically he was tired and he was hungry and he was weathered and he was really, um, the elements of being in the wilderness would have taken a toll on his body, much less the toll of not eating anything. But how can Jesus defeat an enemy and be so physically poor but it was because his spirit was rich because he was, he was pouring into the spirit. He was pouring into that place. And that place will sustain you. That place, if you ever get a doctor's report where it's terminal or it's cancerous or you don't know what the end will look like, you know that you can have joy in the midst of chaos. You could still believe for healing. But it's the spirit of God, the spirit that will rise beyond the physical circumstances and say, stand up, worship. God is good. God is in control. But before we do that, we need to expose the pacifier. So obviously the enemy is a pacifier. So he's trying to say, oh, you just got that report. Why don't you, why don't you tone it back? Don't worry about serving. Don't worry about giving. Don't worry about showing up. Just take it easy. Stay recluse. Stay in your bed. Don't get out of bed. Don't let community in. He is trying. He's the ultimate pacifier but we need to expose his tactics because some of you are being lulled to sleep he's put a little pacifier in your mouth going oh fall asleep in your chaos fall asleep in your sickness fall asleep in your doubt fall asleep in your torment and it's time for us to recognize no I don't want this and throw it away and be like no I will not be pacified by you you know and then we've got to also recognize that there's certain things that we keep pulling off the shelf and there are certain things we do with our bodies so we can pacify the pain or pacify the longing and the cravings and this the, the physical cravings I tell you what if you stopped pacifying the flesh you will recognize the cracks and the gaps in the spirit and if you were to nurture those things and take care of those things I promise you there will be a reverse effect there will be a healing that will happen from the inside out but we must recognize what's lying beneath and we need to expose we need to expose the, the, the pacifier when I was a young mom Cruz was two months old and we went to group one night and all of our team is there and and, and he just would not stop crying and there's nothing more distracting than a baby that's just wailing and just crying and crying. You know, it's like the moms in the, in the room are like, give me that baby. I, I know what to do with that baby. And then the new mom is like, I don't know what I'm doing. He's upset. Like I've tried everything. Gave him the, the pacifier. I, I tried to swaddle him. The reality was he was crying because he was hungry. And it was creating a ruckus 
in the room. It was creating noise and confusion and chaos. And I wonder how much of uh, how many of us in this room are crying out because there's a deep cry for a father's love. There's a deep cry to know someone intimately. There's a deep cry for healing. But we are pacifying the flesh with having sex and getting drunk and, and having serial relationships that we're breaking our, our souls through. And God is saying, spend time with me. I will be able to help you identify that deep crime, that deep hunger. And let's give it what it needs. And what it needs is the God that loves you and the God that is for you. So as we expose the pacifier, what are we doing? We're getting our priorities in order. We're getting the, the devil's tactics are being revealed. We defeat the devil when we starve the superficial things that the devil is feeding us. Jesus was hungry, but he wasn't eating from anything the devil was giving him. I think we're sitting at tables with the enemy, and he is force-feeding us and spoon-feeding us garbage. It's time for us to slam our hands on the table, push our chairs back, and exit those tables once and for all. You know, King David says he prepares a table for me, you know, before my enemies. But that's, that's spectators. That's, that's, that's people that, that harm. But at the table, there is, there is safety. At the table, there is nourishing food. At the table, there is a sense of family and, and a sense of intimacy. And I think some of you are forfeiting sitting at tables with our beautiful father. And you are just eating from the hand of an enemy that he is just feeding you just garbage, and he just wants you to waste time consuming empty calories, consuming empty dreams, consuming empty things that will only last for a moment, but it creates a bigger appetite for more and more and more. We get more money, we want more and more. We get more power, we want more power and more power. That is what the enemy is feeding us. It's a lie. Now, he wants Christians to be in powerful places, but powerful places with purpose, powerful places in strength, powerful places in his will to make a difference, to bring the kingdom a little closer to that timeline, okay, the timeline when Jesus is coming back for the church, because y'all know that's happening, and we're a lot closer to it today than we were yesterday. Luke 12, 2 says, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden, that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. This is basically just saying, guys, stop hiding. Stop living in the dark. Stop living on the other side of a door that's been locked illegitimately locked. It's time for you to come out of hiding. It's time, all these things are known. And I want to invite you to a company of people that are, could possibly be in the same place as you. It doesn't matter how far, how deep you've gotten yourself into trouble. The solution is not for you to stay behind bars, but to come out and expose it, expose the lie, expose the pacifier, expose the past, his love for you. It's, it's, it's a redemption love. It's a restoration kind of love. Nothing that you could have ever done will ever separate you from his love. Nothing, nothing. That's what the Bible says. Nor east nor west, height or depth will separate you from his love. So that should give you courage. Get out of the prison. Come out of darkness. Step into the light. You deserve it. You are loved. There is a future. And there's a journey ahead for you, but don't let that scare you, okay? Is this okay? I had a great time in our first service. God is on the move. I'm so excited for this 21 days. Okay, verse 3, the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Number three, another tactic, tactic of his is a secret attack. It's an identity assassination. So what he does is he comes before you and he's so the audacity to come to you and question who you are. 
especially if you are a child of God, if you've been blood-bought, redeemed by the, 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 the price that Jesus Christ paid, that crimson perfect blood that flowed out of his body that extends beyond humanity, the audacity for him to question your identity. But we don't know that we have power and we have authority, so we get kicked around by an enemy that's an idiot. But you have to know, you have to know that you have authority and you have power and you have dominion. And when you have been saved and when that transaction took place, you became an heir to the kingdom. You've become a friend to Jesus. You have been adopted into the family. So the next time he comes for your identity, you just say, I am a child of God. I am an heir to the kingdom. I belong here. This is my place. This is where I will remain. This is where I will be planted. It's a revelation of self. But we are so consumed with making a name for ourselves and letting the things that we do identify us. And the devil, what he does is he uses that tactic. And before we know it, we're in our late 40s and 50s and we've just gone around the same mountain. He is in the business of wasting your time by asking illegitimate questions about who you are. Know who you are. Know who you are. Okay, his tactics are subtle. He uses the things that have been spoken either against us or for us to his advantage. You know, there have been words given in this place and immediately what comes is the enemy trying to, he's trying to abort. He's aborting these thought, the, the, the possibilities of tomorrow. He's using your identity against you so those seeds, they fall on hard ground or they don't take root. But I'm here to say, if a word has been given, if you have felt the Holy Spirit speak something over your life, that is like breadcrumbs. That is in your, you're identifying with the God who gives identity. He's giving you who you are. And you hold those things close and tight. And don't let his subtle tactics weather you and grate you. First Peter says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Next verse says, tell these stones to become bread. I, I, I just, I, I don't. It, it's mind boggling to me that the enemy would think that he would have the advantage just because he fasted for 40 days. It, it, did you not see what was happening in his spirit? Did you not see what, what the time he was spending with Abba Father? Did you not see what was taking place in, in, in the wilderness? But he comes for the flesh. He comes for the exterior. That's how he comes. He's, he's such a snake. And what he does, he poses as an authority. He poses as an authority because what he does, he's, he goes fishing back to your past, and he's just pulling that refidex out, that director of telling you, nope, that's what you did. No, nope, you don't have authority. Nope, you can't move from there. Nope, you'll never grow out of this. And he leads with misinformation. Hey, you, aren't you the son of God? I mean, that's how you are. Aren't you powerful all knowing? Why don't you, uh, you know, just tell those stones to become bread and feed yourself because you're looking a little, a little sad right now. He was trying to, to just come and put a shadow over Jesus and trying to tell Jesus what to do. But Jesus' response says, man will not live on, on bread alone, but every word that comes from the word of mouth. Every word that comes from the mouth of God. Every word that comes from the mouth. He was trying to convince Jesus to surrender to his instructions. And he questions God's provision. And how many of us are in a wilderness season or we might be stepping into what may seem like a wilderness season and we question God's provision. We don't trust that if God said it, if it's God's will, it's God's bill. <laughs> I think that Mama Joyce says that. And I like that. 
Because we get it twisted. God speaks the word. We're all in. And then we start getting real smart and intelligent and start counting the cost. And we're like, well, I think I need to just like put this to the side and get wisdom. You know. But I think, did he not speak? Did he go back on, does he go back on his word? Because if, 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 if he goes back on his word, then he can't be trusted. And if he can't be trusted, then he's not good. And if he's not good, then he's not in control. And if he's not in control, then what the heck are we doing? Stop saying God said. God doesn't go back on his word. If he gave you an assignment, you do it to the end. You commit to the end. You don't turn back and blame it on God. Stop saying God. I have more respect for somebody that says, I don't want to do it anymore. Than over somebody that says that God said. Just say it. Be a man and a woman. Say, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do college. I don't want to be an intern. I don't want to come to church. Okay, cool. We'll meet you right where you're at. We'll pray for you. We love you. Don't put God in a predicament where he looks like he is a crazy God that speaks from both sides of his mouth. His word is his word. It's his bond. It's blood bought. It's his word and it has power. And it is what it is. Let's stop messing with it. So we need to know his word. We need to wield our swords. That's number five. Don't enter into a chat with the devil. Use your sword. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy to him and said, hey, every word that comes from the mouth of God, he sustained Moses and the people that fled from Egypt. He provided food. He provided manna. He provided all the provisions. He provided everything. And I'm going to trust even now that he will provide and he will sustain. He will provide and he will sustain. He will provide and he will sustain. But our responsibility is we must wield our sword. We must sharpen the sword. We must know, we must read it, we must study it, cross-reference it, talk with your community about it. Because sometimes the feelings get get in the way and we interpret the Bible and it's a false narrative. Go and research, go and get into a commentary situation. Get into the theology of our faith. Understand the why behind certain things we do. Don't let church become a flesh thing. It has to go deeper. It has to infiltrate the spirit and it has to make us strong from the inside out. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are God, he said, throw yours. This is a move. Throw yourself down. The devil said, here's my chance. If I can get Jesus to throw himself and kill himself, then that would mean the cross would be forfeited. And there wouldn't be a chance and a hope for humanity. So here's my shot to assassinate, to kill the hope of the world. Imagine if Jesus in all of his vulnerability would have been like, yeah, you're right, you're right. He was full, 100% man and 100% God. He's out to kill, steal and destroy and repeat that cycle. He has a purpose and he has a will. And in the wilderness, his purpose and his will was to kill Jesus by telling him, jump off the rock, jump off the rock. He was trying. He was trying to remove the power of the cross from the timeline of humanity. But when God is in control and God says it, and when Jesus spends time with God and he realizes the promises and he realizes God's word never returns void and God's word is is his bond, he challenges and he says, Do not put your Lord, your God, to the test. It is also written, do not put the Lord, your God, to God spoke, and it's our responsibility to obey God, not question God. He said it. Our responsibility isn't to negotiate a way out or a way through. Our responsibility is to obey And if God is sovereign and he is good and he is in control and he has comprehensive rule over everything, we can bank on his word that what he said, he will complete it in Jesus' name. Number eight, I skipped number seven. It's 
he's, the devil is strategic. He's the father of lies. Basically, he lured Jesus into this moment to jump off a cliff by saying, he, he, God is going to rescue you. He'll command the angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you're not even, your foot will strike a stone. He was being strategic. He was being sly. He was being conniving and deceiving. But Jesus, number eight, obedience over everything. Obedience over everything. Jesus understood the assignment. He understood the assignment. And then again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms as if everything he tried to lure him with wasn't enough. He takes him to show all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. If you would bow down. And he just gave up his insecurity. He gave up the very thing that he is so desperately in need of. And that is worship. He is wanting to kill, steal, and destroy because he wants to see you bow the knee to him. He wants to be worshiped and glorified. He wants the place of God, but God has no rival. He has no equal. God nodded and that angel, that fallen angel fell out of heaven because God orchestrated and ordained it. And he's been after the very thing from the very beginning. He wants your adoration. He wants your posture. He wants your head postured, your, your body postrated to him. He wants you to worship self. He wants you to worship culture. He wants you to worship other idols. He wants, to wor worship. He wants for you to worship the things that are going to get you ahead. And we can look at those things and think, oh, they're just, they're just ideas. They're just, you know, people that have... You know, they're just creative. No, behind every single one of those idols, it is a devil, devil that is absolutely desperate for your worship. And every time we come into an environment and we are silent and we let our problems consume us, and every time we pass up a moment to be in God's presence, I wonder, I wonder if we were to step into that, I wonder what we would be like once we exit from that situation. I wonder if we would be changed. I wondered if we would be a little bit happier, which sometimes happiness, you know, it's, it's, it's a fickle word, but I think what he wants to give us is joy, which means you can dance and you can sing and you can say his good because that's what joy is in the midst of pain and sorrow and lack. You can still get up and dance. You can still get up and sing. You can still get up and say that God is good. He is sovereign. He has comprehensive rulership and he is in control. The devil is luring us with offers and he lures us to pull us away. There is a spirit that is so rampant. It is a principality, it is a, the spirit of Baal. And what it does is it sits in cities and, and, and it stands as an idol. And what it represents is the, this idol that was fabricated while Moses was getting downloaded all of the law and all of the commandments and the people at the foot of the mountain got desperate because he was up there for 40 days and they said he's not coming back so let's go and build our own idols and so they created this golden calf and they began to worship it so down in the valley they're worshiping this counterfeit idol and up the top Moses is up there being downloaded, the laws and the next steps for humanity. And he comes down with the tablets and he sees what's taking place and he grabs them and he throws them and he smashes them. He said, you are not worthy. We are playing with fire. We look at things as they are solutions for us, but they are things that are pulling us away. The spirit of Baal, what it does is it pulls us 
away. It snaps, like it rips the relationship. It creates tears. We start to doubt. We start, the, frag, the relationship becomes fragmented. That is why there's no more prayer in school. That's why there's no reading of the word in school. That is why we don't see the Bible pinned everywhere around our nation because there has been a separation and a tearing because of this spirit. But I tell you, there's a church on Western End Division called People Church, and we will not be swayed. We will not be convinced. We will not be intimidated, and we will not give in to this spirit. We will rise, and we will say God is good. We will worship no other God. He is the God of the universe, the creator of the heavens of the earth. He is Yahweh. He is our Father, and He is good, and we will worship no other God, no other God. We will worship no other God before Him. And Jesus says, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Our worship belongs to God and God alone. Our worship belongs to God and God, say it, our worship belongs to God and God alone. In Jesus' name, the devil is obsessed with getting our worship and he will not stop at anything to tear us away from the presence of God. But there's a company of people that are set out for the next 21 days. And we're going to hunker down. And we're going to deny the flesh. And we're going to invest in the spirit. And we're going to hear what God has for us. And we're going to move together like a unit. It's not just this front row. But us as a church, we're going to collectively come together clustered. We're going to seek His face. And we're going to move. And we're going to take ground. And darkness will be pushed. And the gates of hell will not prevail. Because the church will rise. It's not feelings. It's not goosebumps. It's truth. It's truth. We have no obligation to the devil. We have no obligation to the devil. Jesus delegated authority over the devil. He resisted the devil with the word and with obedience. How do we conquer? How do we move? How do we become victorious? Through obedience and the word. Through obedience and the word and then the devil left them and angels came and attended him the true king had all authority and obey God so guess what the usurper had to retreat when the fallen angel left faithful angels came to fulfill their rightful role to serve Jesus and worship him and worship him they attended to him when we get to heaven we won't have the ability to have a a will to say yes or no on earth side we get to decide that is why angels stand in awe these creatures are 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 are, are they, they have a will and a mind and they get to choose whether they'll worship god we get to choose to worship god worship the god and the true god and i think i'm running out of time i don't think we'll be able to do communion today but today, just take the little cups with you at home. Take communion tonight with your families. Consecrate the next 21 days. Take, take the, the, the body that was broken and the blood that was shed and, and take it as a symbol of God's grace and take it as a symbol of the second chance that we all get to get every single day and the grace that is offered to us every single day. And as we take it, I really believe that there are things in our hearts that it's time to let go of. There are people, there are names, there are our, our, our relatives, there are friends that are fragmented and fractured. And I believe as you take communion tonight in your home, what you are doing is you are inviting the Holy Spirit into your dwelling place and you will put a stake in the ground and you will say, as for me and my house, we will worship the Lord. Therefore, I will let go of all resentment. I will let go of all of bitterness. I will let go of all of the accounts and all the wrongs that people have done to me because I, I have been freely given. So therefore, I freely can give. You can do this. We can do this. Let's do this together. I love you, church. And I'm so excited about the next 21 days. Why don't we invite Chris to come up? Come on, so good. Can we stand to our feet all over this place? Can we give God a shout of praise?
Almost there. There's a purpose to this. Give me a bottle of water, please. Man, you can just put it right there and be nervous that I won't kick it. So, we go through life thirsty. We're thirsty. We're always thirsty. We want something. We don't know what it is. She mentioned it. Cruz was little. He was crying. He was crying. We learn. We don't learn. We fill. We fill it with what the world tells us to fill it. The word is probably aptly satiated. It's when you have an appetite for something and you don't fill it with what you should, but you fill it with something else. It's why this church thing, this God thing seems so foreign. You, what are you telling me? That, that that's going to fill me? Oh, God's going to fill me. Is he God, God's the answer, is he? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And a simple way of proving that is if what you've been using was enough, you wouldn't have to keep using it. There's a moment in the Bible uh, where Jesus encounters this woman who probably sums up us, all of us. She's a good prototypical example of those who thirst. She's by the well. She's an outcast. She's not actually just thirsty. She's looking for water for all the elements of life. It was essential for cleaning, for cooking, for all the things. And uh, basically what happens is he tells her, if you knew who was standing in front of you, you'd realize that I've got water and you'd never thirst again. Now she doesn't understand what he's saying. Like, you don't know why I just sculled this. Um, because we're not really aware that we've been satiated from birth. We're not aware that the compliments have satiated our desire for being complimented by our God. We're not aware that the titles have, so, have satiated us from having a heavenly title. It's the same play that Ord's preached about in Matthew 4. The devil was counting on the fact that Jesus would respond like humans respond. He was appealing to the human side. Audrey said he's 100% God, 100% man. We don't know how to figure that out. Well, the reality is your physical is just a shell and your spiritual is waiting to come to life. So for all of you who are here today, all of you who have wondered, all of you who are wanted, all of you wondering and just going and searching, let me tell you what salvation is. Salvation is when you and I finally get a descriptor for that empty space we've not been able to fill. The sex won't fill it. The money won't fill it. The title won't fill it. Some of you think that where you are is because you didn't have a dad. Where you are is because you had trauma. Where you are is, oh, no, no, no. Those are human experience issues. But the reality is you're empty. And the only way you know how to get by is to satiate. Some of you satiate by company. The hardest part of the day and of your existence is when you lay your head down and have to wait to fall asleep. It's the one place that the crowd can't get to. Some of you have drowned it out with self-care ideologies and all sorts of things. But I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to do it because you are not filling the space in you that needs it. Now, I did this because the Bible calls Jesus living water. Water that fills. Water that actually gives, water that heals, water that actually stops you from being hungry. It's kind of, I've always said it, you know, when you go shopping and grocery shopping or you order food when you're starving, you end up with like way more than you need. You're susceptible and you'll stay susceptible until you choose to acknowledge that the only thing that can fill you is God Himself. And when you pour Him in, all of a sudden, what you have is what the Bible calls living water. You're not walking around making bad decisions from a thirsty place. Because you went from satiated to spiritually satisfied. I don't know if I believe in the spirit world. Yeah, you do. You do. 
You just haven't labeled it right. The world's doing more of it. The universe, give back, positive, all these things. No, no, no. There's a God. He spoke this place into being. You're here because of that. Oh, I don't know if I believe all that unseen stuff. You can't see your depression. You can't see your anxiety. You can't even namely fully see your insecurity. You try fix it and you can't. I'll tell you why. There is an unseen vase, vase base, space you have not actually filled. So why do I bring this? Because this is how you fill it. The Bible says that God is waiting to be God out here to God in here. This is a implication we can take from reading the Word of God. He's not a God that is distant. He's a God that is indwelling inside of every single believer. The Bible says that what was once a temple that people flocked to, you and me become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Meaning God fills you so the enemy doesn't have to fool you with what he has to offer you. It's a free gift. And it's a gift that is activated verbally. When we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ died and rose again so that you and I might be satisfied and no longer satiated, filled by His presence, saved for eternity, changes your course on earth. I'm not telling you this is a get-rich-quick scheme. I said it last week. Some of you will leave this place and there'll still be giants. All of us will have giants. God deals with giants in two ways. There's some giants He'll kill for you and other giants He likes to kill with you. The giants He kills with you will become messages you preach. The giants He kills for you will be miracles you tell people about. I don't know if I need all the help. No, no, salvation is for the gritty. If you got grit, I'm talking to you. Because the minute you say yes to Jesus, you just made yourself a bigger target to the devil. Because you went from the back blocks of people being satiated and pacified, like that little pacifier Audrey spoke about. We put it in a baby's mouth and they fall asleep. You fool them with what they actually need and you give them what you want. I'm talking for the gritty. Those that want to move from being asleep to being awake. Those who want to wake up and be who God called you to be and you're sick of being trapped by an enemy. If that's you and this resonates, it's not because I'm making sense. It's because God is transferring something in you. If you're saying, Chris, that is me. I need to say yes to Jesus. Then this is what we're going to do, okay? We do it every week. People cheer. People raise their hands. The Bible says if you acknowledge God before man, you acknowledge, He'll acknowledge you before His Father. So I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to bring you down the front. But I really want to know who I'm praying for. I want to know who in this place is saying yes to Jesus and no to pain, no to being trapped by the things of this life. If that's you and this message speaks to you, whether you've said yes to Him in the past and you walked away or this is your first time, on the count of three, all I'm going to get you to do is raise your hand. I'll see it. You'll put it straight back down again and I'm going to include you in a prayer and it'll be eternally just a changer of your life and it'll change your human experience. So all from the front to the back, if that's you, on the count of three, raise your hand. I'll see it and you can put it down again. One, two, three, all over this place. Raise them high, raise them high. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands being raised all over this place. People saying yes to Jesus up the back. People saying yes to Jesus all through this place. People saying yes to Jesus. Another one over there. People saying yes to Jesus. People saying yes to freedom. Amen. Hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray a prayer because we believed in our heart. Now we're going to confess with our mouth. Front to back, left to right. I want you to pray this with me. It's going to invite Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. Are you ready? Come on, pray, uh, pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, come on everybody now. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you in my heart as my Lord and Savior, I thank you. You forgive me of all my sin. I have a hope, a future, and a destiny through a relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.